Hello, chapter six. Remember, Polly was just a little bit in the mood. Sorry, exclaimed Diggory. Well, now, if that isn't just like a girl, what have I done? Oh, nothing, of course, said Polly sarcastically. Only nearly screwed my wrist off in that room with all the waxworks like a cowardly bully. Only struck the bell with the hammer like a silly, illy, it, silly idiot. Only turned back in the woods so that she had time to catch hold of you before we jumped into our own pool. That's all. Oh, said Diggory, very surprised. Well, all right, I'll say I'm sorry. And I really am sorry about what happened in the waxworks room. There, I've said I'm sorry. And now do be decent and come back. I shall be in a frightful hole if you don't. I don't see what's going to happen to you. It's Mr. Ketterling who's going to sit on red-hot chairs and have ice in his bed, isn't it? It isn't that sort of thing, said Diggory. What I'm bothered about is Mother. Suppose that creature went into her room. She might frighten her to death. Oh, I see, said Polly in rather a different tone, voice. All right, we'll call it Pax. I'll come back if I can, but I must go now. And she crawled through the little door into the tunnel, and that dark place among the rafters, which had seemed so exciting in adventures a few hours ago, seemed quite tame and homely now. We must now go back to Uncle Andrew. His poor old heart went pit-a-pat as he staggered down the attic stairs, and he kept on dabbing at his forehead with a handkerchief. When he reached his bedroom, which was the floor below, he locked himself in. And the very first thing he did was to grope in his wardrobe for a bottle and a wine glass, which he always kept hidden there, where Aunt Letty could not find them. He poured himself out a glassful of some nasty grown-up drink and drank it off at one gulp. Then he drew a deep breath. <sighs> Upon my word, he said to himself, I'm dreadfully shaken, most upsetting, and at my time of life. He poured out a second glass and drank it too. Then he began to change his clothes. You have never seen such clothes, but I can remember them. He put on a very high, shiny, stiff collar of the, stort, of the sort that made you hold your chin up all the time. He put on a white waistcoat with a waistcoat with a pattern on it and arranged his gold watch chain across the front. Now, waistcoat is what we would think of as a vest. Waistcoat. He put on his best frock coat. That would be like a suit coat. The one he kept for weddings and funer funerals. He got out his best tall hat and polished it up. There was a vase of flowers put there by Aunt Letty on his dressing table. He took one and put it in his buttonhole. He took a clean handkerchief, a lovely one such as you couldn't buy today, out of the little left-hand drawer and put a few drops of scent on it. He took his eyeglass with the thick black ribbon and screwed it into his eye. Then he looked himself, looked at himself in the mirror. Now he didn't screw it into his eye. Think of a round thing that you would put into your eye and then kind of hold it with your eye. Little eyeglass and it was attached with a ribbon. Children have one kind of silliness, as you know, and grown-ups have another kind. At this moment, Uncle Andrew was beginning to be silly in a very grown-up way. Now that the witch was no longer in the same room with him, he was quickly forgetting how she had frightened him and thinking more and more of her wonderful beauty. He kept on saying to himself, A fine woman, a fine woman, a superb creature. He had also somehow managed to forget that it was the children who had got hold of this superb creature. He felt as if he himself, by his magic, had called her out of the unknown worlds. Andrew, my boy, he said to himself as he looked in the glass, you're a devilish well-preserved fellow for your age, a distinguished-looking man, sir. You see, the foolish old man was actually beginning to imagine the witch would fall in love with him. The two drinks probably had something to do with it, and so had his best clothes. But he was, in any case, as vain as a peacock.
That was why he had become a magician. He unlocked the door, went downstairs, sent the housemaid out to fetch a hansom or a cab. Everyone had lots of servants in those days, and looked into the drawing room. There, as he expected, he found at Aunt Letty. She was busily mending a mattress. It lay on the floor near the window, and she was kneeling on it. Ah, Letitia, my dear, said Uncle Andrew, I ah uh, have to go out. Just lend me five pounds or so. There's a good gal. Gal was the way he pronounced girl. No, Andrew, dear, said Aunt Letty in her firm, quiet voice without looking up from her work. I've told you without, I've told you time, times without number that I will not lend you money. Now, pray don't be troublesome, dear, my dear gal. It's most important. You will put me in a deucedly awkward position if you don't. Andrew, said Aunt Letty, looking him straight in the face, I wonder you are not ashamed to ask me for money. There was a long, dull story of a grown-up kind behind these words. All you need to know is that Uncle Andrew, what with managing dear Aunt Letty's business matters for her, and never doing any work, and running up large bills for brandy and cigars, which Aunt Letty had paid for again and again, had made her a good deal poorer than she had been thirty years ago. My dear girl, said Uncle Andrew, you don't understand. I shall have some quite unexpected expenses today. I have to do a little entertaining. Come now, don't be tiresome. And who, pray, are you going to entertain, Andrew? asked Aunt Letty. A, a most distinguished visitor has just arrived. Distinguished fiddlestick, said Aunt Letty. There hasn't been a ring at the bell for the last hour. At that moment, the door was suddenly flung open. Aunt Letty looked around and saw with amazement that an enormous woman, splendidly dressed, with bare arms and flashing eyes, stood in the doorway. It was the witch. Ba -da -da. Until next time.